Hello, assalamu alaikum and good evening. Welcome to another episode of The Classics Show. I am your host, Shabnam Riaz. As always, it's a wonderful part of the week for me and I hope it is for you as well, the viewers that we have watching this program, because this is that, you know, that time of the week when we actually get to unwind, as I say so many times, and slow down with the rat race going on, all those chores that we have to do, you know, life in general, work, everything is so fast paced. And I find that literature is a time when you can sort of slow down, both, both mentally and emotionally as well. So that's something that we really look forward to. Anyway, for today's um, topic of the program, we are going to talk about George Orwell. And George Orwell, of course, was an English novelist, a critic, and um, he was a journalist as well. Among his notable works, Animal Farm, 1984, amongst others. So to speak about George Orwell today, we have with us our guest, Mr. Esas Vasti, who is a development communication professional, a journalist, poet and writer, and radio host. Thank you for joining us here. You're very welcome, and uh, thank you for inviting me. Our pleasure. Okay, so um, when we talk about George Orwell, uh, the Times ranked George Orwell as second on the list of um, the greatest British writers since 1945. Uh, what set him apart from the rest? There are very few novelists who are, who are uh, uh, recent in their work, who are very current, uh, even after 50 or so years of their uh, death. Uh, Orwell's work is a kind of uh, uh, a mirror to us uh, in, in the sense that uh, it uh, uh, gets ideas which uh, are not time bound. The ideas uh, where societies develop, how societies develop, how revolutions are formed, how counter revolutions are formed. Mm. So, uh, uh, being the author of uh, uh, not one but two uh, great books, great mm. novels, uh, uh, Orwell definitely has a place uh, amongst the highest rated novelists uh, of, uh, of any time. Um, it's very difficult to actually uh, compare art with art uh, because uh, definitely uh, you cannot uh, rate uh, Everyone has Orwell. Their own yeah, exactly. Yes, exactly. Yes. You cannot rate Orwell against Tolstoy mm. or Orwell against Kafka or mm. anyone else. Uh, everyone is is good and great in their own league. Mm. But uh, what sets Orwell apart is uh, his uh, his unique sense of uh, time, uh, how uh, it has formed uh, in, in uh, uh, the recent history and what uh, uh, Orwell could see in the future, uh, which uh, not many novelists uh, can claim uh, uh, to, to authentically uh, say. I mean, uh, Orwell wrote for, for, for generations to come and that's he why had I, a vision. He, he had a vision. He, mm. he definitely was a visionary in, in the sense that he knew what was about to come. Mm -hmm. And uh, the amazing part is that uh, 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 by the time his novels were published, uh, they were good, they were well received. Uh, but uh, at the time of publishing, it, uh, when uh, let's say uh, if we talk about 1984, mm. when 1984 was, uh, was ready to be published, uh, no publisher was ready to print it. Mm. Uh, the Second World War was uh, uh, on and uh, Orwell tried to convince uh, the mm. publishers that uh, uh, that uh, you, you have to go with it. Although he Even had though he had recognition, yeah. worldwide exactly, recognition at exactly. that time with Animal And Farm. that was probably like uh, publishing 1984 was, was much more easy for him as compared mm. to publishing Animal Farm. Yeah, which because had a lot of... Uh, exactly. The, uh, I mean... Uh, 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 that was again like uh, mm. uh, since 1984 was published right after the uh, the Second World War. Animal Farm was published uh, uh, like uh, by the end of the first, uh, first uh, Second World War. Mm. So what happened there was since it was a criticism of uh, of uh, uh, this uh, the Soviet Union at that time. Uh, uh, the, uh, he he tried to convince the the publishers that this work is uh, uh, is something that is going to happen. This is something mm. uh, like uh, the, the work was that of counter revolution, and he he predicted that counter revolution is bound to happen, as in French Revolution or any any other revolution, mm. and uh, nobody believed him. And uh, somehow he got it published, and it was the bestseller when when the war was over. So Absolutely. that's 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 yeah, something unique about exactly. it. Exactly. 
Okay, now his novel, 1984, dystopian novel, yeah. and um, you know, d let's discuss the utopian and dystopian fiction as well. Sure. Uh, the difference uh, between them and how both are employed <coughs> in many works of fiction as well. Sure. Um, uh, I believe uh, utopian literature is, uh, is something that would not go out of fashion. Mm. Uh, uh, you see uh, a utopian work of art everywhere. Uh, you s when we talk about novels, I, I believe uh, the first great work uh, in utopian uh, um, uh, novels is uh, Jonathan Swift's Gulliver's Travels, mm -hmm. which uh, is unique in the sense that uh, it, uh, um, it gives uh, a hint to a dystopian universe in a utopian world. It, it, it mm -hmm. gives, to, uh, uh, gives us an idea about uh, a world that exists where things are uh, very different from what we, we perceive, perceive them to normal. be yeah. mm, and exactly. uh, uh, yet very acceptable for us. And once we get into these worlds, we, uh, we adjust to things. Mm. But uh, the interesting part is that that world already exists around us. Mm. Uh, for example, uh, Gulliver's Travel had uh, this uh, uh, unique idea of uh, Swift like hidden in, 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 in its uh, b uh, between the lines that uh, he was pointing out at the differences between uh, the British and the Scottish uh, people at the time, uh, the cruelty that was there, the oppression that was there, he was, he was cle clearly talking about that. And uh, somehow, somehow, as, as one of the, his critics said that uh, he hit bullseye with a uh, uh, wrong target. So he, he made something mm. that was considered uh, a work of child fiction children and literature. children literature. Yeah, so that's, that's uh, interesting in the sense that uh, something that's being considered children literature at one time mm. is uh, basically a great work of satire at, at another time. Uh, similarly, when you when you talk about dystopian literature, dystopian ideas, uh, I believe uh, no one come close to Orwell's uh, uh, 1984. And as we say, like or 1984 is a transition from the animal form, mm. uh, where he first discussed revolution and counter revolution. And in 1984, he discussed mm. the, the ideas of uh, totalitarianism and uh, mm. uh, the ideas of oppression that exist in generally in, in, in different societies. Mm. So uh, when you talk about uh, uh, a dystopian world, you talk about a very disturbed world, a world mm. which is dark, a world uh, which we uh, feel like, which we desire to not exist, but uh, again... But the uh, attraction as, is there. Yeah, exactly, exactly. The, the visionary uh, in the writer sees that, okay, this mm. world uh, probably does not exist at the mm. moment, but it might exist mm. in the future. Because in fact, is it not, you know, a very clever sort of an, an analysis and a balance between the the darkness and the light of a human being in general, yes. because they carry both with them, uh, a utopian and dystopian being inside. Yes. And so then that just, given the different situations and circumstances in life, can present itself in many ways. Yeah, definitely. Uh, a great work of satire is like uh, a great uh, uh, work of uh, surgery, for example, but like he, what he did was that he, uh, he knew that people like uh, people, readers all around the world, they want to go into uh, a fantasy world, a mm. world that uh, takes them away from their current worries. Mm. So he he first takes them away from that particular area, from the, that particular time, mm. and then when they reach into his his universe, the the universe of fantasy, he hits them with the truth. He hits them with the, with something that uh, 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 wakes them, that basically gives them the idea that the world that they live in could mm. exist uh, in a much worse form if they mm. don't do anything about it. Mm. So that's that's uh, the uh, something unique about dystopian world and dystopian literature. Right. We'll talk about his technique and you know the different literary techniques that he used in his writing as well. Uh, first of all, let's start with his childhood and what led him up to being the person that he was and his right. and the first time that he wrote and. 
uh, what, what exactly shaped his thoughts? Okay, uh, uh, he was born in 1903, uh, and uh, interesting to know that uh, he belonged to the subcontinent. He he uh, was born in Bengal, uh, was, which was part of the larger India at that time. Mm. Uh, and uh, as a toddler, he was taken to to England. Uh, he uh, studied at a uh, school in Sussex, mm -hmm. and uh, since he was born in a middle class family of of the time. Uh, uh, he was born to a uh, father who was a British uh, civil servant at, at that time. He uh, basically developed this idea of not fitting in to the elite society. Mm -hmm. uh, though his parents tried their best to give him the best of educations and all, mm -hmm. uh, but in the school, uh, in the uh, places where he lived, he could not fit in. He mm -hmm. was always trying to find uh, that connection that he has lost over the years uh, with the, uh, the general masses. Mm -hmm. uh, again, the struggle to get out of that that problem, that issue, that psychological problem as, as well mm. of, of uh, fitting in. He uh, uh, traveled to Burma, he joined the, the, police. the police as well mm. and uh, uh, yeah. there he was on uh, again on the other side of, of uh, uh, the world uh, where uh, he was the one who was being considered uh, an oppressor mm. because uh, the police did not have that uh, good a reputation with mm. the general public. And uh, when he was stationed in Burma, he also uh, started off uh, like as a, a documentary filmmaker. He, he mm. shot a documentary about mm. Burma uh, which uh, showed uh, a side of Burma where there were miseries, where there mm. were uh, problems, issues, but the police was there. Uh, and he was a part of the police, and, mm. and again, uh, he it was, was a conflict being, of emotions yeah, exactly, for him. Exactly, exactly, yeah. a great conflict, and mm. and uh, that conflict basically led him uh, to leave the police force mm. and uh, and uh, go back to England. Right. Okay. So you mentioned something very interesting: uh, the not fitting in, yeah, the misfit. Okay. So the misfit syndrome. How much of that actually contributes to a writer? in general and also Orwell as well, in them exploring and re-exploring exactly that connectivity and where that last piece of the jigsaw puzzle is going to fit. I believe, uh, well, when you talk about not fitting in, um, it's it's mostly about uh, how uh, are you not fitting in. If uh, you are concerned about the kind of uh, uh, social uh, sector that you belong to, the kind of, uh, 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 let's say, nationality that you have, the kind of, uh, the kind of language barriers that that could exist for you, mm. and these uh, ideas uh, uh, play a very important role in a writer's development. Mm. Uh, when uh, you talk about uh, uh, not fitting in, in the case of uh, George Orwell, he basically tried to fit into the masses and uh, he could not because he was not a part of the masses. Mm. So he tried to know and understand what was the difficulty, what was the barrier that basically stopped him uh, from being a part of that uh, 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 group. Mm. and. Why would he not be accepted in either groups, not neither the elitists or not the, the, the general masses or the marginalized group. Mm. So uh, Orwell tried to fit in and uh, as he uh, uh, wrote an essay uh, when um, the early 1940s, he uh, the essay was titled Why I Write and uh, he basically explored his own technique in, in, in that particular essay and he, he clearly says that like after 1936 when uh, he came back from a, a visit uh, uh, around uh, France and uh, uh, England and especially the areas where there, there, there this marginalized, marginalized groups exist. Uh, he clearly says that uh, after 1936, most of my work uh, has been around uh, the democratic socialism and the criticism to totali totalitarianism. So mm. that's uh, that's uh, what clearly defines him. Uh, he he understands where he stands, mm. 
and he knows that this conflict between the totalitarianism and democratic socialism would mm. continue for ages and generations to come. And this is the, the most uh, interesting part that uh, you might be familiar that uh, the New York Times uh, uh, rated 1984 as the best seller uh, novel in 2017, January 2017 and December 2016. So what was the reason for this comeback? The reason was again the debate around uh, the US uh, general elections which were kind of being considered uh, a conflict between the democratic socialism and the totalitarianism. Mm. Uh, uh, I, I believe uh, the US in general and uh, 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 the public around the world uh, has not uh, like uh, listened to this, this particular terminology of democratic socialism since 1984 was published or since Orwell wrote about it. Mm. And then there came the US candidates including Bernie Sanders and and others who were talking about democratic socialism. Mm. So uh, this is the reason why 1984, why Animal Farm and George Orwell is current because if a writer is uh, a bestseller like after 50 or so years of his death, exactly. he definitely is, is current and recent. Definitely. So what method was he employing when we talk about literary technique as well that made him, you know, at that time as well and then now so appealing? Well, Orwell was a journalist by heart, like mm. uh, uh, like myself. I I consider a journalist by heart as as a person who tries to run away from uh, the society uh, in in general, in in the sense that he cannot work with the uh, 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 journalistic uh, ideas, but he still want to exist in that society. So he he was mm, earlier in his career he was a journalist by profession, but he knew that. Being a journalist, he cannot make a difference. So mm. to make a difference, he wanted to use that technique of journalism uh, and utilize it in developing a novel. And for that purpose, he uh, he utilized... Uh, so he used both to his advantage. Yeah, exactly. Exactly, he did. He did. And uh, 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 his brevity and his uh, the ideas that he generated from uh, uh, his journalism experience, mm. he utilized them in his books. Mm. And uh, other than that, uh, there is this interesting study that uh, Orwell uh, uh, basically worked a lot harder on uh, how to uh, symbolize things in animal form in 1984 uh, in comparison to uh, uh, the, the amount of time and work he spent on the topic because the topic he already knew. Uh, mm. The topic was the marginalized world around him. The mm. topic was revolution and counter revolution. Mm. But he, want, he, he did not want to do a narrative essay on it. Mm. He wanted to what develop... Make people think exactly, exactly. and connect with them. So he wanted to uh, develop a novel which mm. was current, which was recent, which was uh, interesting, which mm. uh, which uh, generated as good a response as Jonathan Swift uh, um, uh, did with the, the Gulliver's Travel. Mm. So for the first novel, he utilized the tool of fable. He for animal form, you have these talking animals, mm. and you you have these interesting Each conversations. Highly symbolic. Exactly, mm. and uh, uh, that makes it interesting for the general public. You never get bored of fables. Uh, fables uh, have existed uh, like throughout history mm. and uh, probably the oldest form of literature that you have is fable. So he utilized that, that fable and he symbolized the, the ideas of revolution, the ideas of counter-revolution that were very current at that time mm. and uh, it's, it's being considered uh, as one of the greatest work of satire. And similarly for 1984, he did not want to reuse the, a tool that he had already used. Mm. So he, he went for a tool that was probably a tad bit new at the time and probably a, a more visionary in its sense, but uh, he knew that it would work and mm. that tool was of science fiction. Mm. So 1984 is basically a science fiction novel set in the future. Mm. Uh, because How did he make this transition from fable to science fiction? Uh, it's, uh, probably it, it has a lot to do with the, uh, his uh, understanding of uh, the world and his understanding that people get bored very easily. He, he knew what his readers wanted. He knew that uh, uh, the Second World War was a time where science flourished. 
for all the negative or positive reasons, but mm. uh, science flourished in, in every way. Scientists were considered heroes or demigods at the time. So, mm. he, he wanted to utilize a tool that, that was basically very close to heart uh, 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 for the public in general. And there he, he uh, went with the uh, uh, science fiction book mm -hmm. and that science fiction turned out to be the greatest work of satire ever since. We'll come back to that question after this break. Sure. Stay with us, don't change the channel. Stimulation of the family. You're so pretty. Unorthodox loyalties which can only lead to thought crime. back to the program and today we're talking about George Orwell and his famous works in particular 1984. Okay um, now let's talk about 1984 we've talked about you know the imagery symbolism yeah. and all that what exactly is the concept? Uh, there were many unique concepts in 1984 it, it approached the, uh, the uh, current ideas very differently because uh, uh, whenever we talk about things we talk in a very literal sense, but uh, uh, the people who exploit uh, the masses, the people who, who are generally uh, the ones who, who basically have this uh, idea that uh, the masses are for uh, their well-being and the masses should work the way they want them to work, they utilize different different tools or different ideas or different thought processes uh, which they bring on. Like uh, for example, uh, there is this concept of not uh, 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 to mean what you say. Uh, I mean uh, in George Orwell's universe, uh, this becomes a tool of oppression. He basically devises uh, uh, offices based on this particular idea. Mm. So, uh, in his world in 1984, in the big brother's world, uh, the, the big brother is basically that, that power that overpowers everyone in, in, in 1984. Mm. Um, there are three ministries which are at work. Uh, there is this uh, uh, ministry of love, 
there is this uh, uh, ministry of truth and there is this uh, ministry of peace. Mm -hmm. uh, as the name suggests, uh, these should be the ministries that promote love, truth or uh, peace. Mm -hmm. But uh, uh, in originality, they are not uh, promoting any of these things. They are uh, promoting the very opposite of it. Mm -hmm. The ministry of truth basically tries uh, to uh, to make uh, propaganda real for mm. for people the ministry of truth in 1984 mm. uh, is the one that uh, uh, takes the ideas which are already well established is, uh, and and they change it mm. they, they convert it to to the very opposite mm. the ministry of love is in origin a ministry of hate mm. because the ministry uh, tries to promote that uh, there should be uh, hatred against mm. people mm. who do not uh, uh, condone your ideas. And that's again a very a, a clever, a very exactly. clever ploy very, by very Orwell clever. here, yeah. uh, because there always is such such a fine line, a divide between these two opposite emotions. Exactly. So that's also something very clever that he uh, Definitely, definitely. I mean, uh, for his concept of uh, uh, ministry of uh, love, the ministry of love holds this this particular uh, 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 two minutes hate session every day uh, where people participate and uh, their anger and their hatred is uh, is developed uh, and uh, oh, it's developed many fold by by showing them the cruelties of so called enemies that that exist in in, in their world mm -hmm. and uh, this two minute hate uh, is usually something that uh, uh, that we come up with in our society at different levels. Mm. There are certain very independent uh, uh, media media organizations or people that you see mm. certain parts of social media being utilized uh, uh, in in that way, where you see that hatred is being sold in the form of love. Mm. So that's the idea that uh, uh, Orwell tried to, to exactly or will try to elaborate that mm. uh, whatever uh, uh, they embody, uh, whatever they try to hide behind, the truth is always there and you can try your your best and you can find that out. Uh, the Ministry of Peace, for example, in that particular uh, book is uh, a ministry that promotes war. Mm. so that 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 concept, that idea uh, gives us a sense of uh, of reality in, mm. in general. And he's very cleverly, you know, discussed and explored humans as they are yep. uh, complex emotional beings. So the love, the hate, the peace, exactly. betrayal as well. Exactly, exactly. I mean, he deals with betrayal, which is again something that is just, you know, something that has been definitely uh, at the center of many many pieces of what literature. what made it uh, more uh, significant for the time was that uh, uh, the the world wars were definitely a very big influence on on orwell's work mm. and uh, uh, the nazis were an example of of what we should not do what a decent human being should not do mm. and they personified everything that Orwell wanted to bring to his book mm. and uh, that's uh, why he, he utilized different tools which are already in practice in, in, in the Nazis world and that uh, uh, also include let's say for example the radicalization of youth, mm. uh, uh, youth being radicalized, being provided with fundamental ideas mm. uh, on, on uh, something that does not exist to work against their, their parents, to work against their teachers mm. or everyone around them because uh, the propagandists they knew that uh, youth is the, the target that they can easily maneuver and easy, easily they can they can move uh, mm. uh, uh, them whatever way they want to mm. and that is why uh, Orwell clearly indicates in his book that this is happening this is happening in your world mm. so if you want to make a difference mm. come and make a difference. Mm. He's also um, you know elaborating a lot upon mind control. Yep and uh, how it is to <coughs> imprison anyone. You don't need chains. Exactly. You just need to take control and have the power over their exercising of thought and perception. Exactly. 
and uh, uh, the most interesting part in that is that he utilized the tool of science fiction and new developments and new inventions which were probably which did not like exist at the time they uh, he he devised this concept of television uh, mm. uh, which uh, was was not there before but his idea of television is not a television it, his idea of television is something which is, which is a two way of communication where you mm. actually have uh, a video uh, surveillance of things and in, in, in places and in today's world where you you different conspiracy theorists come up with different ideas about how the cameras in your laptops and your mm. cell phones mm. are, are uh, a window to your your personal information mm. or your personal ideas and where everything exists on uh, on chips and and you can uh, uh, you can feel that okay uh, Artificial somehow somehow you uh, uh, enter a new city and you get this up, uh, update from uh, from uh, some social media website that uh, uh, welcome to this particular city mm. and you didn't inform the social media mm. website where you are exactly. so uh, these ideas uh, they started off in in Orwell's 1984 uh, the surveillance, how uh, is this feeling uh, damaging for a person, person's uh, personal growth and his ideas that you are continuously being watched. Mm. So that, that uh, definitely uh, was a very important idea discussed in mm. the book. Right. He also spoke about a world without poets, uh, without, um, without writers, without thinking. Yes. So thought uh, was a crime in Orwell's uh, 1984. Uh, in the world that he lives in, Oceania, which is a fictional uh, name of a country, he devised three countries in that universe, Oceania, Eurasia and East Asia. Hmm. He combined different uh, uh, ideas of, of monarchies, of uh, uh, totalitarianism, of uh, revolutions in the country and he placed them in these countries. So, uh, thought uh, thinking when you make thinking a crime uh, and that too through a very unique technique he, he invented a tool in, in his uh, uh, book that's called Newspeak. Mm. Uh, Newspeak is a form of language where they, uh, uh, the words which imply emotions, mm. the words uh, which imply the significance of something or uh, the quality of something, um, they are removed from the dictionary. So uh, in Newspeak, the ministry of truth becomes mini true or the ministry of uh, 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 love become mini love. So he, he basically tried to control the language and when you control the language, you control mm. the thoughts. Mm. Uh, it's very uh, difficult to come up with ideas when you do not have a language to think them Express in. yourself with. So uh, this is, this is uh, a, a, a unique aspect of, of 1984 that uh, um, the big brother in that particular world understands that whenever there are poets, literary people, people who can think for themselves. And people, make others think. Yes, exactly. Mm. And uh, people who, who can have independent thoughts, they, there's always a chance of revolution. There's always mm. a chance mm. that people would be uh, countered, people mm. would uh, come up with ideas. And in ideas. fact, as history has told us, that whenever anything <clears throat> like this have been, has been perceived, it's always been the thinkers, it's yep. always been the writers, the intellectuals, the poets who've been rounded up. And then the first people who was, you know, uh, made sure that their thought was not traveling. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. Uh, thinkers are the ones uh, who initiate the ideas and these mm. ideas that develop into reality and Orwell being himself a thinker because he thought of many ideas at the time in, in, in which he expressed in the book that which are uh, uh, inventions right now. I mean as I mentioned earlier like the, the concept of television or the concept of uh, a device where you can have two-way communication on video or two-way communication on audio uh, that was his idea back in the times and mm. uh, you see a uh, very developed form of these these inventions mm. in, in our world today. Mm, absolutely. Okay, so um, now you know here we're talking about the importance of poets, of writers, uh, people who are able to think for themselves and also 
uh, provoke that food for thought in mm -hmm. other people as well. Now you yourself, you write poetry, yeah. and um, so I'm sure that there's something that you're going to share with us. Uh, well, definitely, and uh, uh, since uh, what uh, uh, we are discussing here today is very important, and uh, it it uh, it talks about the concept of individual freedom. It talks about the concept of uh, freedom of thought. Uh, I believe uh, a very relevant uh, uh, poem I, I wrote. Uh, it's titled "Freedom." Mm. Uh, so that that probably I share yes, for please, the please. audience. I spread my wings and behold. I spread my wings and behold, I could fly. I could see the sky. I could listen to my friends and shout. The wind, the scent, the cloud. I could feel it filling my wings, lifting my spirit, building a tide. The first stride. Broke into the mesh, wounded. I flapped again. Bleeding green, I flapped and failed. O oh, freedom, I can see you. I can feel you. O oh, freedom, I can see you, I can feel, I can listen. Will you heal? By the gusts of wind, not that banyan tree. It is but me who makes me free. free. Wonderful. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you very much. Right. Again, that, you know, as, as we've been talking about, uh, it is, you know, the poets, the writers who are able to give another dimension yeah to a single word mm -hmm. and how people perceive that word and you know uh, how they sit and actually examine about what's happening to them in their lives and ex and everything that's come to you know uh, your situation many people are just so content to stay where they are it's actually the writers who will come along mm -hmm. and create those ripples i believe having individual ideas at a time when individual ideas are very scarce where people try to condone with uh, uh, joint ideas, mm. combined ideologies, mm. and uh, uh, they don't think for themselves, but mm. they they believe in people to think for them. Mm. Uh, is a world where you you uh, cannot make a difference. Mm. Uh, if you wish to make a difference, if you are not satisfied with what is going on around you, mm. you you write something, you express something mm. which is your original thought. How how Mm, ever small that thought be, however uh, um, minute you, you consider your idea to be, however insignificant you believe your thought is, mm -hmm. uh, it would definitely make a difference because small things make a huge difference at times. Absolutely. So. Okay, so you know, there are so many people who have something to say. Uh, many write, they don't come forward with their work, they you know, it may be they may be shy of sharing it, or they may be actually apprehensive of the uh, of the way they're going to be received, of how people are going to uh, rate their work and tell them, uh, are you good, are you bad, whatever. So how do we get a literary movement? How do we get, especially when we're talking about our youngsters, talking about the challenges that we are facing as a nation, how do we employ them to come together and to understand the importance of literature and also to take out all that talent that they have? Uh, well, what uh, I call it is, uh, uh, you can call it PTRD or the post from telecommunication revolution syndrome, not DS actually syndrome, mm -hmm. <laughs> but I, I personally would go with. Mm -hmm. I mean, the telecom revolution has somehow uh, had this this very significant effect on, on, on our thought processes, on the youngsters, on youth, on everyone. Mm -hmm. uh, Definitely good forms of communication are important in a society where, where you have to communicate and where you, you, mm. where you, you must communicate mm. to, to get your ideas out and to get new ideas in. But when you uh, make these communications insignificant by, by uh, uh, 
uh, let's say uh, missing out on the language or missing out on uh, on 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 expression but rather depending uh, or making people dependent upon let's say smileys for example let's mm. say uh, on on the uh, the the cellular lingo that you have mm. that mm. you the text you come up with uh, the texting yeah, the yeah. small uh, okay. uh, yeah. abbreviations that which were which are doing are replacing and you know that's a very interesting thought because yeah. when you said language is the controller of a society yeah. and their expression of thought here again Definitely. we have another controlling element mm -hmm. because so many people will just even use those abbreviations while they are you know uh, emailing, emailing or whatever or, or just or, yeah, or writing, writing an article i mean how yeah. how, how uh, difficult it has become for most uh, of the people to actually write. I mm. mean, uh, 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 people consider uh, why not express it in in a in a, in a small way? Why not express it in something which is which does not uh, uh, need like let's say two thousand words? Why not go with a small like uh, four hundred words, mm. three hundred words article or a piece mm. that could be published online that has these significant headings or forward. I mean, uh, it's it's definitely good at times when you want brevity, but uh, 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 brevity at the cost of uh, loss of uh, quality. thought process. That's, and quality that's, as yeah, well. Quality. That's, so, that's you know, not good. Exactly, exactly. So, you know, um, we're talking about uh, reconnection. Yep. So reconnection with one's language and reconnection with the written word uh, is something that's so important. Yep. Uh, do you think that having so much information and having so much communication in a way has limited our forms of expression and creativity? Uh, it has. I, 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 I agree with you. I, it has. Uh, uh, the point is that uh, uh, we have uh, uh, a lot of uh, uh, channels uh, mm -hmm. to communicate through. Uh, we can communicate through different mediums, but then again, we have this persona that we have developed over social media that we want to maintain. So the communication that is happening is between that persona and the people who know that persona. The, mm. there, there is the, a lack of real communication with real people around. We That's really the the literary groups that uh, should exist in societies or the or the thought groups or the communication groups that that have been here mm. uh, in 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 subcontinent and internationally mm. uh, produced many great writers. Exactly. It was a nurturing environment yep. Yep. because that, that those were the places places where people used to go to hear those uh, great exactly. writers and the conversation they were having exactly. with each other and they've slowly diminished and the whatsapp groups and the and the and the social media groups uh, have to, uh, taken uh, 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 them in and like uh, uh, now instead of communicating with uh, a lot of people personally giving them the ideas uh, uh, by your own self you mm. you believe that that persona of yours that exists on the social media mm. would give the, the idea to the, these particular That's people. That's very interesting what, you, what you've just touched upon because um, isn't it you know the absolute truth that until you can own the person that you are you're not going to be able to move forward Is in it? any way at all because then if you are not happy with who you are how can you be happy with the relationships that you form with the society that you move in and the the job the, the profession that you're in definitely and um what I, I, I personally think is this uh, uh, idea of dependence, this, this idea of uh, uh, how dependent we have uh, become to the channels that exist instead of the, the message that that should be is probably it's, it's playing a lot of uh, and, uh, role. As you're saying, they're shaping yeah. your thought. Exactly, exactly, exactly. And that's, that's something. Uh, I have another poem if, if you would Please, like yes, to, and, yes. and that's uh, quite relevant to this particular topic that you're right, discussing. Yes, uh, it's called Happy Independence. So uh -huh. uh, it, it, it might very relate. Interesting. Okay. Right. So it starts <clears throat> Tainted by leering gazes, twisted in lusty fantasies. You dazzle, O oh, Emerald Venus 
with the hundred and one ecstasies. Untouched, unbridled, unburnt, unsure, the cellophane sky, the land obscure. How long, you say? How long indeed? The trodden path would pain endure. The left, the right, with all their might, were never asked, but stand to fight. For me, I ask. For you, they say. And cut and slash, my blood they splash. Mm. For me, you show the doubts, the fears. For you, they smile on a bloody pile. Where in dependence, I lay and bleed for another few years. Independence. Very, very good. Fantastic. Absolutely. You, you were able to describe that so well. And, and I love yeah. the way you put the independence. Uh, that's very clever as well. <laughs> it's so true. Um, to get people to write, people to come forward, to express their thoughts. And, you know, as we just said, it, there is such a danger of uh, especially younger minds mm. being shaped. Yeah into this sense of fakeness? Uh, the idea of, of uh, uh, existing as you wish or existing uh, as you desire uh, was always there. It has always been there. But that existence was true in the nature that you worked hard for becoming what you want to become. Absolutely. But now the access to information has provided you with an opportunity to utilize the social media in a way where you can definitely uh, be whatever you want to be. Hmm. You can exist uh, as a person with very moderate ideas uh, when originally you don't have those ideas. Hmm. And that opportunity which could be utilized for the betterment. Could be if if uh, prop, if the users are properly trained, mm. is being uh, 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 wasted away with 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 the uh, ideas being thrown away. So this particular aspect of life, I believe, is something that uh, we should uh, uh, try to to look upon, to try to think upon that how can we make changes in the lives of the younger generation, mm. how can we make them actually read books, how can we actually make them understand. And question. That, yeah, exactly. And question exactly. as well. Exactly. Uh, Mr. Saspasti, thank you so much for joining us here today. We've really had a wonderful conversation and I'm sure the viewers will really, really have enjoyed this episode. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for inviting me. Okay, so we come to the end of today's uh, program. It was really, really a, a fantastic discussion with our guest. We were talking about George Orwell and then you know, we were talking about the, the power of thought and how your thinking shapes exactly who you are today and how you're going to live the rest of your life. So until next week, bye-bye. <laughs>